Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com, and it is episode number 204 of Goulet Q&A, my weekly thing where I sit here and talk about pens into a camera. But uh, thanks so much for inviting me into your lives. I'm going to try to make this next period of time between 40 and 60 minutes well worth it for you. I've got seven questions for you today, but before I get into that, uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about my last week. I've got a lot of products to talk about, but... I, been up to a couple of things. I went up to see my in-laws this weekend, which is always good. I'm on like really good relations with my in-laws, uh, both my with Rachel's parents and Rachel's with my parents. So it's really cool to get to spend time together as a family. Um, so that's pretty neat. So we got to um, spend some good time. My nephew is uh, five months old, I think, around there, and uh, is starting to crawl. So that's fun and entertaining. And uh, my niece is about two and a half, and she is potty training. So that's an adventure. So really fun times. And Rachel and I are like, oh, I remember all this time, and I don't miss it at all. <laughs> so it's just kind of fun and adventurous. Uh, love my in-laws, and they are having a good old family time so got to have our kids there their kids just kids everywhere they just dominated and it's just organized chaos every day um, but it was fun so i brought my video camera up there shot some like vlog style video i've messed around with some new microphones and stuff like that so just kind of on the personal front like not only do i do the whole video thing here with gulay pens but i actually really enjoy it just like personally as well and i've shot so much like video and photo footage uh of my kids that i have never done anything with i don't know if you are like this but you know, whether you, whether it's like kids or family or pets or anything like that, like just we catalog so much of our lives now that uh, I wonder, is any of this ever going to get looked at again? Because <laughs> I've got like, I think I seriously have somewhere around 15,000 pictures of my kids. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating in the last eight years or so that we've had kids. So, and I'm like 15,000 pictures. Like there's some of these pictures I'm just never going to look at again for sure. Um, but then like, what are, are they going to like graduate high school and I'm going to give them like 40,000 pictures of themselves? <laughs> like what is my plan here? I don't know. I just figured I better capture it. That way at least I have the option to do something with it in the future. I don't know if you're like me at all, but that's just kind of where I'm at. But still, I actually like shot a video with the family, all the kids together and everything. And then I edited it on Sunday night and I sent it out to the family. I felt like a freaking rock star because not only did I capture a really good fun family weekend together, but then I got to like immortalize it into seven minutes of film. So that was really fun and cool and just kind of personally interesting to me. I've um, been shooting a lot of right now videos, which has been fun. Got to have some more of our team on. We got to have Whitney, Eric, and Jeremy, uh, as well as had Rachel on. We talked about Colorverse. We talked about the Twisby Ecos, talked about all kinds of fun stuff. It's just been really, really great. So trying to rotate as many people um, from our team on as possible. And uh, I've got, you know, a couple more weeks worth where I'm going to have people on. Um, it's really just on a volunteer basis that we're having people on. So it's uh, that's kind of my strategy is kind of whatever order people sign up and want to do it and are willing to do it and it works out in everybody's schedule that's how we're doing it um we put out uh, we work it we are working on uh our final lami factory tour video uh which is like what when did that happen oh yeah that was uh early december uh it's taking a little while and appreciate your patience on that thank you for the folks at lami for being patient as well um just because there's so much to put together and we've had so much going on andy started like two weeks before I went on this trip. So she's like learning the ropes. Um, but anyway, we are working on that. It's very much going to be like a how it's made style. If you remember that show from like the 90s, um, you know, of like doing factory tours and stuff like that. Um, we're going to do something kind of similar in that style. It's going to be really cool. Like all this like super detailed footage of how they, you know, assemble an all-star, how they, you know, fill their ink bottles and cartridges and manufacture converters and all that kind of stuff. It's pretty, pretty cool, especially if you're into that, like kind of stuff like I am. Um, and then we're going to have another video that's going to be um, an, uh, of when we went to Edison, which was in January. Uh, that's like a vlog style with me and Drew kind of bopping around and going on that trip. That, was actually, that should be pretty fun, too. Kind of similar in style to what we did with uh, the, my trip to Germany. Uh, except, obviously, way less planes and airports involved. Um, <laughs> we got, uh, within the last week, we got in the Twisby Eco T in yellow green, which uh, I've talked about this a little bit at this point. So I'll kind of like talk about it here and then kind of shut up about it because I've talked about it and right now. I've talked about it on my own 
you know, Instagram stories and stuff like that. And I don't want to like over talk about it, but anyway, um, it's different enough where I thought I should mention it. So um, Eco T, if you're not super familiar with it, um, it's slightly different than the Eco, same price, same nib, all that stuff. The only difference really is the triangularity of the pen. So it's got a triangular cap, a triangular filler knob, and a slightly more triangular grip than the Eco does. And the grip, the Eco grip is really just round and Eco T is slightly tapered, not as harsh as Lamy Safari, but slightly. Um, I talked about this a while ago when the blue came out, but that pen kind of came and went and it's been a little while since an Eco T has come out. This is the next one, it's a special edition color, so it's gonna come, it's gonna go. Um, but it's not as bright lime green. I'm seeing how it's gonna, you know, it looks a little highlightery, um, but you can see it's, it's very much like a uh, key lime pie or maybe like a guacamole kind of, kind of look to it, um, as opposed to just the straight up bright green of the Eco Lime. So wanted to kind of give those pens a little bit of a shout out. We are gonna be getting restocked on the, the yellow green. We never really know with Twisby because of, based of um, you know how many they have and what the demand is, um, but we are gonna get some more, so we should have that for a little bit. There, uh, let's see here, we've also had um, the Mana Verde Monza is coming out in extra fine. If you happen to be into that, it's a more kind of a more affordable range pen. Um, so we have that, and the extra fine is actually pretty decent. I was kind of surprised, um, you know, how fine it is and whatnot. So that's cool. We have that in all the different colors. Um, we also have the Aurora Optima Flex in, uh, I think we got a couple more dark blue. Um, so we, those are gonna be almost on the way out. That was the first one that came. And then we're gonna have one in light blue, which is very much like a UNC Tar Heels kind of color. Um, sky blue, you know, baby blue, like any, any type of color like that um, should be kind of cool. And then um, let's talk about Fa Faber-Castell or Graf von Faber-Castell uh, in their inks. So they have six new ink colors that just came out, which are pretty cool. I'm actually, they're, I'm kind of jiving on these colors. Um, so they have burned orange, cognac, and I'm looking at the list because I can't remember them all. Uh, electric pink, olive green, royal blue, and turquoise. You can check those out on our site. They're up there with all the other colors. So expanding the Faber-Castell line is pretty cool. Um, the inks are nicer, you know, on the price year end, but the bottles are pretty hefty and pretty solid looking. So those are cool. Um, and then the Faber-Castell Op Art in Flamingo uh, just came out this week, so you can check that one out if you're interested. They came, they come out with these Op Arts. Seems to be kind of an annual thing. So we didn't go like super crazy heavy on them, um, but we have them available for you in all the nib sizes um, that they offer so that you can check them out. I think it's all the nib sizes they offer. I'm not sure on that actually, so don't hold me to that. <laughs> just check out what's on our site. That's what we have. Uh, we also, in right now, have The People Have Spoken, and uh, Rachel's a big fan of the Faber-Castell Loom, and uh, she loves the broad nibs, the Loom and Broad, specifically. Uh, and we basically discontinued carrying a lot of the broad uh, Faber-Castells because they just weren't selling. I mean, I'm talking like one or two a year, just not selling, and not enough to carry the carrying costs and everything, taking up the space and the time of carrying those uh, for us as a retailer. But, you know... Rachel's really passionate about it, and um, we kind of just put it out there with everybody. Hey, are you interested in broad nibs? And we got some good feedback that, yes, in fact, there was interest on it. So, um, you know, that's, uh, we like to listen to that kind of stuff. So we've offered more of the looms in broad. It so happens that at the same time, they were basically discontinuing most of the colors, except for the gunmetal. And now they are releasing uh, three new colors, which are all kind of silvery, olive -y looking colors. So you can check them out on our site pretty soon, but we are going to have them in broad. So you can be happy about that and they'll be the same price as the uh, uh, good metals. And then we got a new ink color, Robert Oster Motor Oil, which is pretty cool looking color. You should check that out. It's kind of, kind of a, you know, it basically looks like motor oil with kind of a black sheen, I guess I could call it. That's very interesting ink, but you can check that one out. It's kind of cool. And then uh, we have a new Organics Studio uh, Hemingway Teal Blue. It's one of their sheening colors. It's on the way. It may actually be here, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's coming on Friday or not when this publishes, but uh, we'll have it very, very soon if we don't have it already when you see this. Um, we ordered a bunch and uh, it's a pretty interesting color, so you should check it out. Heavy sheen, just like the other three that we have. Uh, I'm still waiting on uh, the new Panayer pens. They may come next week, I'm not 100% sure. So if you remember, I did the interview with Dante and kind of showed you those new Panayer Le Grande Bellezas. Um, you can check those out pretty cool. The nibs are very interesting, so I'm curious to see how those are received once they kind of get out into the wild. Uh, and then the, we're still waiting on the Pelican M600 turquoise white, uh, which is 
super interesting and very hotly uh, anticipated. So we'll see once those come in. They may come next week. I'm not sure. I'm just waiting any day to hear anything about them. So we don't have them in hand. We don't have tracking or anything yet, but we're anticipating they're coming sometime soon because we were told mid-March and I'm told that they could arrive any day to our distributor and then be a couple days to us and then we'd have them uh, for you all. Uh, let's see here, what else? Um, the Duraflexes. So let's talk about those for just a hot second. Um, I meant to talk about that with Rachel this morning and right now, but uh, didn't. Uh, so I have the Duraflex, so these pens, uh, the first batch we had came and went very quickly in a couple of hours. Uh, and I will say we've had a bunch of people sign up for the email notification list. I can already say they're gonna fly and it's gonna be super crazy demand. So um, with that in mind, it's gonna be kind of a mess <laughs> in like a good way, but also not a great way. Just I think that not everybody's gonna be able to get the pen. They're a limited pen. They only made 1898 of them. Uh, we by no means got all of them, but uh, of what we got, I think there's just way more people that want them still. I think part of the reason is because, I mean, it's a nice looking pen for sure, like the black and the rose gold. They did a good job with this, but part of it is because it's a steel flex nib that's relatively affordable, right? Um, so I have uh, definitely sent all of the information that we've gotten about how well they've been received and the demand, all this kind of stuff to Conklin. I've been talking with the folks there uh, at Yaffa who distributes Conklin and just like, hey, you know, everybody's kind of going crazy over these nibs. Is there any way that we can do anything here? And they've definitely gotten the message and I can say publicly that they are going to be putting these Duraflex nibs on not just another future pen, but they're gonna make it available as a nib size option on all Conklin pens. So that's pretty exciting. So if you're not super into the Duragraph, it's gonna be available on an All-American. It's gonna be available on uh, eventually like the, uh, the Crescent and all, this other, the, all the other Conklin models. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's going to be a couple of months probably before that's going to happen because um, basically they're trying to make them and you know whatever they're making they're like putting on these pens first because that's the one they came out with but message has been received that they are popular so they are working on them adapting them to fit on the different pens and uh, that is uh, something that's uh, should maybe give you some hope and inspiration so that if you don't happen to get the next batch of this particular Duraflex pen, you can at least know that you'll have the opportunity to get this nib on other pens. You know, it's, it's a Duragraph Durgra style. So yes, if you really like the black and rose gold, you're gonna be want to be like super onto this one. And probably we got to talk on the team is like how we're gonna actually launch that. Um, it's still probably a couple of weeks out at this point because uh, I don't I don't you know have any notification that they're coming yet, and usually that means it's still a little bit. Um, but when they do come, we're probably going to look to do like everybody that's on our email notification list will probably email everybody there and say, hey, we're going to do a timed release at this time and then give you all a heads up. So if you are interested in this, go ahead and get on the email notification list. It's not a pre-order kind of thing because we would have already oversold if we had done that, but um, it's uh, at least advanced notice and then we'll try to manage it as well as we possibly can given it the limited stock. And I think that will uh, pretty much cover all the new products that I have for right now. So let's get into the questions for this week, shall we? Pen and writing questions. First one is from Kedzie Stark on Twitter. Can you recommend some pens with especially grippy grip sections, like with knurling or made of materials with a lot of traction? My hands get tired bearing down on slippery pens. Uh, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about slippery pens or pen grips, I guess. Um, there's a couple of different ways uh, that you can achieve this. One of them is mechanical, so um, either like with the texture of the pen or the form, the shape of the grip, um, or you can have the material, uh, which is like the actual substance that it's made of. Think of like a rubber grip versus a slick metal grip. Um, all other factors, you can have kind of one or the other or a combination of both that can determine how grippy a pen actually is. And everybody's got different tastes, right? We all have different finger sizes. We all have different, you know, Rachel holds her pens with four fingers. I hold mine with three. I have very oily hands. So, you know, slick metal grips are slippery for me and hard to hold. Other people, it doesn't really matter. They write their pens for three words at a time and they're fine with whatever. Other people like to write for two hours at a time and they need something that's super comfortable and very grippy even when you are like sweaty and oily and all that kind of stuff. So really depends on a lot of different factors, but I think I can pretty much lump them into two separate buckets. It's either a mechanical texture-based or a kind of material-based 
um, that affects the grippiness the most. Um, so thinking about like the mechanical or the texture based ones, you've got uh, like you can have like a matte finish to it that can just give you a little more surface area, a little more friction. That's one way you can achieve it. Um, you can have knurling, kind of like what you said there, um, you know, some kind of like specific like grooves or something like that into it. Um, you can have the shape of it, like a finger form, thinking about like a Lamy Safari or something of like that triangular grip. Uh, or you can have some kind of like cross hatching or, or some other kind of, you know, cutting into the thing. I guess it can be lumped under knurling, but, um, you know, pens specifically that have this kind of, you know, texture to it. Um, you know, Lamy 2000 is one that comes to mind as far as like a matte finish or a brushed finish. Um, this one specifically, it's not so much like front to back because it's, it's, it's not so much a matte finish, this is more of a brushed finish. And I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so I can show you some of these grips because I think the texture, uh, close-up texture is gonna matter for this. So this one you can see, it's got a brush thing and they actually take like sandpaper basically and you know, just sand down the pens. So this one, uh, you know, going this way, front to back on the pen, it's pretty slick. But side to side, that's where you're gonna get most of your grip. Um, so depending, you know, it's like that may or may not work uh, ideally for some, but that's an example of kind of that matte texture. Um, thinking about another one, like if you have a um, Lamy CP1, right? Like it's got kind of this ribbed, it's plastic, you know, so it's kind of middle of the road in terms of its grippiness, but the fact that it's got these, this knurling here, that's really gonna give you good uh, kind of front to back uh, texture uh, and, and keep it grippier in your hand. So that's an example of that. Thinking about, uh, this one's got kind of a, uh, combination here. This is the uh, Jin Hao. This is the X450. And uh, this one has somewhat of a triangular. It's got kind of an indentation of triangular and it has grooves in there. So it's got kind of two things going for you to help give you a solid grip on that one. And then of course the kind of iconic Lamy Safari. Uh, this one has a very distinct triangular grip that helps uh, to do it as well as you know, the grip kind of tapers and then flares out at the end. So it kind of keeps it from uh, your fingers from slipping off on the end there. So a couple of different ways. And actually this one is a matte finish too. And then, you know, just some examples of other ones. I'm gonna keep going because I got a bunch of these. Um, the Pilot's Plumix has the same kind of thing, triangular grip. Um, not as pronounced maybe necessarily as the Lamy, but still there. Pilot Kakuno is the same way, a little more subtle there, but definitely has a triangular thing. A lot of times pens that are marketed towards children, um, you know, which like the Kakuno kind of is, the Pelican Twist definitely is. This is a crazy looking pen, isn't it? It's, a tr it's an actual triangular pen that like twists and stuff, so pretty wild. Um, but that one, that's got kind of both actually, this has kind of a rubbery grip as well, as well as kind of the mechanical. Uh, design aspect to it. So that's some examples right there. Thinking specifically about materials now, um, you know, anything that's grippy or kind of hygroscopic, right? Which means that it absorbs uh, moisture. Uh, you know, the, the twist is actually a good kind of segue to get into that because it's, it's both. It's got the mechanical form as well as uh, kind of a rubbery grip to it. So that helps in a couple of different ways. Uh, going back to Lamy, Lamy has a lot of different grips actually on their pens. The Lamy Studio specifically in the stainless steel has a rubber grip. So even though it's uh, kind of a slick and tapered form, which the Studio, the other models of the Studio all have slick metal grips. So it's like some of the most challenging for people like me who have oily fingers, but the rubber one, this action is pretty good, which is why I have this uh, stainless steel one in my personal collection. And it just looks cool, right? Like, it looks very shiny. Uh, okay. Uh, Ebonite pen, so like this one's a Conklin Classic. There you go, you can see it. So Conklin Classic, this is an Ebonite pen, and uh, the grip itself is made of Ebonite. So Ebonite is a hygroscopic material, which means that it's, uh, it can absorb moisture to a degree. So it's really good, especially for hand oils. Um, a lot of people enjoy Ebonite pens uh, who like to write for long writing sessions because of that hygroscopic nature. So that's an example of one that's really good, or like a Noodler's uh, Ebonite pen. They have a couple different models that they make an Ebonite. This is an Ebonite Conrad, and uh, it's got kind of the same thing going on. It's got an Ebonite grip that uh, can be good. Now, granted, if you're writing with a flex pen, not necessarily the most enjoyable thing for long writing sessions, but it still gives you a little bit better sense of grip. Um, and then a couple different materials. This one, <laughs> you probably haven't seen this pen uh, in a while, if you have ever. This is the Delta uh, Magnifica Amalfi. So this is a pretty crazy looking pen. I don't know, some people think it looks 
crazy and ugly, but I actually really love this pen, which is why I got one personally. Um, but this uh, has celluloid. So celluloid, it looks kind of like plastic. You know, it's a form of resin, but it is a cellulosic material. It's a nature, natural based material as opposed to just straight up like petroleum plastic. Um, and so it actually has uh, somewhat more of a grip to it than just straight up plastic. So it's not as grippy as ebonite, but it does have a little more grip to it. So celluloid is, it takes forever to form. It's an expensive material to make, but it does have those hygroscopic properties. So if you happen to find a pen that has a, a, um, a celluloid material or something like the uh, rest in peace Omos, um, this is the Ojiva the Ojiba Alba, uh, is a kind of a mixture. So Omos and Aurora, uh, you know, they call theirs Aurora Lloyd. Omos uh, called theirs, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but uh, it was a um, uh, basically kind of a, a blend of acrylic uh, um, uh, acetate, I believe it was, and um, celluloid. So acro acroloid? No, I can't remember. Um, couple different companies like Visconti, Aurora, Omos, they have blends that are kind of like between celluloid and resin. So you get a little bit more of a grip uh, on these types of pens as well uh, that can, that can, you know, be a factor. And then uh, last one that I have is uh, Visconti Homo Sapiens. And there's, there's going to be other pens. This is not an exhaustive list. I'm just trying to give you some examples. Um, but uh, the Homo Sapiens is uh, volcanic resin. So it's uh, same kind of thing. Like you're getting some hygroscopic properties of this, just like you would have uh, with ebonite. This feels a lot like ebonite. It's a little denser, a little harder, you know, heavier. Um, but the material itself feels a lot like ebonite. And uh, mine is actually kind of nice and shiny now because it's I've used it so long. I've been my daily carry for almost two years, basically, um, that it's uh, it's worked out uh, pretty well, and I've shined it up a little bit just from handling it so much. Cool. All right, that was a lot of pens. That was a lot of pens I showed you once right there. I think I'm through most of my pen demonstration uh, for the Q and A here. This was a lot of those were for uh, that particular question right off the bat. All right, next one I have is from Vivic VS on uh, sorry Vivic VS 1992. Vivek versus 1992 on Twitter. I don't know. I don't understand your handle, but more power to you. Why is screw capping still a predominant capping mechanism even on premium pens? I have a Pilot Cavalier that starts wet even after a week, so sealing is not a problem. Also, why aren't there many pens with magnetic capping? And I'm just realizing now I forgot to grab a magnetic pen, so I'm gonna have to go over to my little pen drawer and get that in a second. Um, let's talk about Screw capping first. So um, part of the reason that you see a lot of pens, and this is mainly in my opinion, I don't know necessarily, I haven't talked to every pen manufacturer why they do it. Some of it may be tradition, some of it may be, that's just the way they do it and that's the way the equipment's set up so it's easier that way. Um, I think a lot of pen companies do that because for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that um, it's kind of a subtle undisturbed way to, um, to cap your pen. You know, you can have threads that are not very sharp that allow you to hold the pen and you can put them kind of in multiple places if your fingers are on them. You know, some people are, are disturbed by the threads. Other people like me, I'm, I almost never am bothered by holding onto threads. Um, maybe it's just, you know, the way my skin is or something, I don't know. Um, but um, it's, it's, you can still keep a pretty slim profile to the pen. Some other, you know, filling or some other cap mechanisms sometimes stick out a little bit more and can be more obtrusive. Um, with threads, you kind of know what you're getting there. I think honestly, a lot of the reason is for durability and longevity, um, you know, and security, I guess. So, you know, the nice thing about a screw cap is it's pretty difficult for a pen to come unscrewed completely on its own. If you have a cap pen, you know, like I love my Lamy 2000, but even still, like if it gets, you know, if I have it in my pocket or something like that, it is possible for there to be some kind of pressure that has on it and for it to separate. Um, I have never had that happen basically with any snap cap pen, but I've heard of it happening to other people. You know, Lamy Safari or something like that. There's a mechanical mechanism in here that is you know, having some kind of pressure that's coming done and undone and undone and undone and undone over and over and over again for years and years and years and years and years, potentially that could break down, that could fail, it could weaken, it could, you know, over time could weaken. And, um, specifically, I think it's more of an issue if you have, um, you know, people that are carrying them around their notebooks, like I have a traveler's notebook right here. Um, if I am 
you know, carrying it into a pen thing or if I'm just kind of snapping it in place like this, you know, and I'm putting this in and out of my backpack, this could potentially like, you know, rub and grab and stuff like that and it could come undone. You're really not gonna have that happen with a screw cap. So it's slightly more secure, um, especially for the long term. You know, threads are gonna last a really long time, maybe longer than a snap type mechanism could. Um, I think that's, that's a lot of it right there. What else did I put in my notes? That seems to be all I can remember right now. Um, yeah, especially with, with heavier pens too. You know, Lamy Safari, okay, maybe that's one thing, but I'm thinking like, um, what have I got here? The uh, Luna. The uh, Visconti Opera Master, right? It's a heavy pen. This thing is like 60 grams. So if I had a snap cap with this, with like a 40 gram body, there's a lot of weight there and the thing could come snapped and undone. Um, whereas a screw cap is gonna be much more stable there. Um, I also think in terms of aesthetics, you know, if you have, you're talking about premium pens, they tend to be heavier, they tend to be bigger. That puts a lot of pressure on a, a cap mechanism um, and threads are really strong and, and really can hold firm. Um, and then, you know, when you have something like, for example, this is the Luna, right? Uh, if you look in here, part of the design aspect of the pen is that it's a little translucent. Uh, and because of the mechanism being basically threads on the body, uh, right here, right on the grip, and then threads on the cap here, which are mostly covered by the center band, aesthetically, you don't have anything else kind of intruding on it. You get to see the mechanism, you get to see the nib and the grip and all that kind of stuff up there. It looks very clean. Whereas if I have something like, you know, Lamy 2000, if you can look up in here, um, you know, there's a mechanical system in here. It's pressure bars up at the top. Ugh, I need to clean out my pen. Um, there's these pressure bars here on the side. There's gonna be an insert there. Um, and there's gonna be these little snap mechanism pieces in here. So if I were to have a demonstrator version of a snap cap like this, it just wouldn't look as pretty because you're gonna see all those kind of metal mechanical elements in there that are operating the snap mechanism and it's, uh, it's just not gonna look necessarily as clean. So that could be particular, maybe one aspect of it. Um, and then uh, let's talk about magnetic caps, right? Give me a hot second, let me grab one because I have it right here. I'm going to bust out an oldie but goodie here for you. So this is the Monteverde Regatta. This was the Rose Gold Edition, which was a limited edition. What number do I have? I don't even remember. I should have the number on here somewhere. Uh, number 007 out of 999. That's pretty cool that I was able to snag 007. Um, so this is a rose gold one, uh, and this one has a magnetic cap in it. So the magnet here is sitting right in the cap. I guess I'll zoom in for you so you can see what's going on. We're zooming in and out all over the place today. So it's got the magnetic cap. It's got to be a pretty strong magnet to keep it on here securely. And you can see it's like a magnet that's just kind of, you know, glued in here. The magnet is probably, um, I don't know, slightly over there, a quarter inch deep, or maybe a centimeter or so in, in length. Uh, in there, if you can see that, it goes up to about here on the inside of the pen, right? So from here to here is a big magnet. And then, uh, you know, this part here, I don't know if this is a magnet, I think it's just metal. So that's gotta be able to latch onto it, right? Which this pen just sounds so cool, you know? And we have, um, you know, the they don't have this pen anymore, but they have the Northern Lights one, which is kind of a similar um, design, but it's got the crazy like iridescent kind of pattern to it. So um, to get a good grip like that, um, and then to have it post as well, you have to very specifically design the pen for this purpose. And this pen right here, it's got a bit of a step because you've got that whole magnet in there. So unless you had, you know, the pen that was just way bigger, uh, you know, the cap was way bigger than the rest, it's gonna have a difficult time. Um, there are some pens that, that have it slightly less of a step there, like I'm thinking specifically of the Visconti Rembrandt and the Van Gogh. Um, those ones are some of the like really well designed. And honestly, the, um, the uh, Le Grande Bellezza, the new Penider ones, are pretty well designed as well. But it, it's somewhat limiting having to fit this giant magnet in here and then design it into the pen itself. It's just, it makes it difficult. Not everybody likes the magnetic aspect, so I think some of it may be popularity as well. Um, but it's just, it's more difficult to engineer a pen with a big magnet in it. And that's really just about it. And I'm sure there's like a cost element in it as well. I don't know any magnetic cap pen that's under $100 that I'm trying to recall any that I've ever seen, and I can't. So 
Um, you know, I think it's just a lot of different factors there, but that's kind of what you got going on. All right, let's talk about ink. So Ray C on Facebook says, I've watched a lot of ink reviews and I'm wondering what is so important about the water test? Are people writing in the shower, in the rain, by the pool while crying? I don't get it. All right, Ray, feel your pain. I hear this a lot, a lot from people. Like, what is the big deal about water resistance and permanence and all that kind of stuff? Who cares? It's ink, it's pens, you know, it's like no one ever cared about permanence until they got into fountain pens, really. Uh, and all of a sudden it becomes important. So part of it is, you know, fountain pen ink is more watery. If you start using, you know, good paper, it's slightly less absorbent. You can smear, you can, you know, all that kind of stuff. So some of it is when you start really getting into it and using and you want to get good shading properties, so you use more ink resistant paper, more ink resistant paper whatever ink you use on it is going to absorb less into that paper, whether it's a ball point, roller ball, whatever, it's not going to be quite as permanent onto that ink resistant paper because the ink is resisting the paper or it's resisting the, I mean, sorry, the paper is resisting the ink, right? And vice versa, I guess. Um, a lot of these, uh, you know, permanent inks that you have are cellulose reactive, which means that they actually need to make contact with the cellulosic fibers in the paper to make a permanent bond. So, um, certain inks, certain paper combinations can, um, you know, have, have a, a, a kind of a combination factor there involved with the permanence quality. So um, I think a lot of the reason that uh, it does matter so much for people is not so much that they're like writing by the pool and stuff like that, though that could definitely be the case. I think more it's just like in everyday life, you might spill something or get some drips or whatever. And it could, you know, if you have completely non-waterproof ink, it can run to the point where you actually can't read it anymore. Um, and I've had this happen on some of my own notebooks, especially if you use really heavily saturated dye uh, ink colors. Uh, it can run and it can kind of make a mess if you spill anything or drop anything. Um, some people like to write outside, you know, they might be at the cafe or something like that. It starts to rain, get a couple of drips that can wreak havoc on a full page of writing if you get some water drips right onto the very ink resistant paper. Um, and it can kind of spread it out and just make it make it hard to read what you wrote. Um, you know, other people, it might be if they're drinking coffee or if they're drinking water, and you know, if you got water with ice in it and the drip condensation drips off of it onto your notebook, bah, that's frustrating. So for some people that really matters a lot and they want their writing to last for years and years and years and years and years and years and years, and, years, and they just want it to be as permanent as possible. So there's definitely reasons for why people want to use it. And there, it's by all means, it is not like a universal thing. A lot of people in the fountain pen world are enthusiastic about the, that quality in writing ink, other people could care less, or couldn't care less, I should say. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just kind of it. So I think the reason that it comes up so much and why you see kind of these drip tests with different, um, you know, different uh, ink colors and stuff like that is because a lot of the manufacturers don't talk about how waterproof or how water resistant their ink colors are. So really, if you want that as a property for your ink, you have to test, you have to know, you, you, you know, because nothing is said about it, unless it's an ink that's specifically marketed for that purpose, which you are, then people have no idea. So you're, if you, if that quality is important to you, you're limited to the couple of permanent or waterproof, you know, ones, the Noodler's Bulletproof and Eternal and all that kind of stuff. Uh, other, but if you're, if you want to use a, a new brand that is coming out and it's like, is anything in this brand have any element of water resistance to it? I would like to know. Well, tough. No one says it. So you're, so all these people are forced to either test it or seek out people who are doing ink reviews and asking about it before they make an investment on that particular ink color and get their hopes up about it and find out their hopes were dashed. So I get it. I think it's not so much that everybody wants it. I think it's more that those who want it need to know whether it's water resistant or not. And so it ends up coming up a lot and getting discussed a lot. But in reality, it's, you know, it's probably a, people are interested to know or they'd like to know if it has an option. And probably if, if all ink companies just said how water resistant their inks are, it would be talked about a lot less. It's just because people have to go and seek it out themselves. It ends up coming up pretty much any time there's an ink review. So that's why anybody who does blogging, anybody who does these ink reviews or videos or anything like that, we all end up, and I've done this myself, we all end up doing water tests and smear tests and all this kind of stuff because it literally comes up 
every single time we talk about a new ink. Every time we talk about a new ink, people are like, how water resistant is it? <laughs> That's like one of the first questions. Just like when we come out with a pen, they're like, is it your eyedropper convertible? <laughs> That's like, I can guarantee you that's, you know, to the point where now, like, when there's a new brand that we're looking to carry, that's pretty much just carte blanche, I know. If it's a pen, how can you, you know, how much ink does it hold? How is it eyedropper convertible if it's a cartridge converter pen? You know, if it's an ink, okay, does it sheen? Does it shimmer? What's the dry time? Is it water resistant? I know everything I'm going to be asked, so I'm just going to include all that stuff anytime I talk about an ink or do an ink review, if I know it. But because I'm not provided with that information, I have to go through this full gamut of testing to be able to answer those questions. And that takes a lot of time and I don't always have that time. And so um, it just ends up getting asked and asked and asked and asked and asked over and over again. Um, but there you go. And then to balance out your question, Ray, I have another one from Shelvinator on Twitter that says, is looking for water resistant ink a fool's errand because it depends so much on the paper. Rhodia coating makes resistant inks wash off while Leuchtturm clings to even non-resistant ones. I just thought it was just a teensy bit irony that like the next question was going to be asking about seeking out for water resistant inks. I couldn't, I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist coupling these two questions together. All right, so Shelvinator, you're looking for a water resistant ink. Cool. You're like, is it a fool's errand? You're, you took it in a little bit different direction. You're talking about the paper, which I just alluded to a second ago. Um, the paper can make a difference. Uh, no, it's not a fool's errand. And you can definitely get a, a huge difference in the ink's performance, um, even if you're using an ink-resistant ink paper. So, um, you know, something like Rhodia, sure, that is a quite an ink-resistant paper. They use a high clay content um, to give you better shading. Uh, to give you more bleed through resistance, more ghosting resistance and all that kind of stuff. Um, Cause basically the ink is gonna sit on the, on the surface of the paper longer. A more absorbent paper, like a cotton paper, even Leuchtturm. Uh, Leuchtturm is still a pretty good quality paper, but it is more absorbent than Rhodia. Um, you're gonna have a better dry time on papers like that, but you're gonna get slightly more feathering, spread, bleed through, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and uh, you're gonna get less smearing and, and a more call it permanent quality to it, um, or at least seemingly permanent, you're gonna get, it's gonna dry in there easier, it's not gonna smear away. I think still if you drop water on it and like try to wash it away, it's still, if it's not a permanent ink, it's still gonna wash away. Uh, it just maybe wouldn't smear as much and, and might seem more permanent than uh, a paper like Erodia or something like that. Um, if you are using a, a truly a, a, a water resistant ink, you're going to see better performance of it even on something like Rhodia, um, it might just take a little longer because the, the ink, the, sorry, the paper is resisting that ink. It's pushing it away. It's saying, I don't want you in me. Stay on top. Uh, but eventually it's going to kind of soak, excuse me, soak in a little bit and it's going to absorb. And once the cellulosic uh, reactive ink bonds to that paper, you're good. Uh, or if you're using like a pigmented ink that kind of sits on top of the paper, like a platinum carbon black or a sailor kiwaguro or something like that, that's going to sit on top of the page and really dry on the paper. And then you can pretty much use that. That's, that's universally like better uh, ink for that purpose on whatever type of paper. Um, but uh, it is kind of a catch 22, you know, because ink resistant papers have coating that resists the ink so that it doesn't bleed and feather and stuff like that. But at the same time, it kind of works against you when permanence is what you're looking for. So sometimes saying you're using like something like a Noodler's Black, right? Very, very permanent ink. Uh, but at the same time, it can take, honestly, like upwards of a day or two to fully absorb into something like a Rhodia to the point where it will be like locked in and fully permanent. Now there's varying degrees of it, right? Like depending on how ink resistant your paper is, how permanent the ink is and how quickly it absorbs into the page and then how quickly it needs to be water resistant. Like if you're writing, say you're writing with an ink, you know, and it's, you've written it two minutes ago on a super ink resistant paper and you drop your notebook into the pool, you're probably out of luck. Like that thing is probably ruined. Uh, but if you write with it and it sits on your desk for a day and has a chance to dry and all that stuff, and then your dog comes up and slobbers all over it, or your kid knocks over a cup of milk all over your notebook, you're going to be in a lot better shape having let it sit in like that for a little bit. So that 
that is going to be a factor as well. So you see how there's all these different factors and things that affect uh, the performance of permanence specifically in the paper um, is yet another element to all of that. And then of course, like how much ink is being put down, your nib size, the flow, all that can also be a factor as well. And your, your environment in the air, if you have a much wetter environment and there's already a lot of moisture in your paper, that is also going to resist the ink from drying into the page. Whereas if you're in a very arid environment, your ink is gonna dry a lot faster, both because it's absorbing into the air, the moisture is absorbing into the air, and it's absorbing faster into your paper because the paper's drier. So all different kinds of fun things involved here. Um, but bottom line is the paper can make a big difference, specifically in how fast an ink becomes permanent, but it is not a moot point. It is a worthy battle for you to, to fight you're not really fighting a battle, but it's a worthy uh, journey, d just discovery, treasure hunt, whatever you want to call it. It's a worthy effort. That's what I'm trying to say uh, for you to try to find a combination of a permanent ink and whatever type of paper it is that you enjoy. But, you know, if permanence is above all your most important thing, then maybe take a paper that's like a middle of the road, like a Leuchtturm or an Apica or something like that. Marmon Nemesine and uh, and try using you know a permanent ink on it and see if you find it acceptable for what your needs are. This is part of the journey is getting to discover okay what is the best combination of all these different things for me for my specific needs and what I find important for the way that I'm writing. That's why there's so many different combinations of all these different things because there's no one perfect fit for everybody and the journey is the reward right. All right let's talk a little bit about troubleshooting. So Carl K on Facebook has a question, says, I'm willing to try heat setting an uncooperative nib and ebonite feed unit when necessary, but how can I be sure when the feed is ebonite and not plastic? I can't tell them apart. Carl, you are not alone there because it's really hard to tell apart if you don't know specifically what it is you're dealing with. Um, so I grabbed a couple of different pens. I have Noodler's pen, which has an ebonite feed. I have Aurora and I have uh, Omos, all of these have ebonite feeds, and pretty much everybody else is plastic that I can think of. There's there's some other ebonite feeds out there. These are the ones that were top of mind for me. Um, most most companies are plastic. You can assume that most pens are plastic. The ebonite feeds are actually so rare these days uh, with modern pens. I'm what I'm talking about. Modern pens. It's so rare that pretty much any company that has an ebonite feed is going to specifically call that out as a feature of the pen because it's more expensive, it's more complicated, it's a different manufacturing process. Plastic feeds, you just injection mold them, you can make them all day long. Ebonite feeds have to actually be machined mechanically, and it takes way longer, and they have to be doing one at a time, and there's all these different steps. It's a much more involved process, and you typically only see it on more expensive pens. Noodlers is somewhat of an exception there. Um, and there may be other, couple other bargain, not bargain brands, I hate to use that word, but you know, lower priced value brands um, that might have ebonite feeds too, um, that I'm failing to recall their names, but um, it's pretty rare. Like most pen companies are, have moved to plastic feeds just because it's so much more practical from a manufacturing standpoint to make them, um, that that's what pretty much everybody's moved to. And the reliability is pretty good. When you're talking about flex pens, that's where it can really get stressed because the amount of ink flow that is needed for those can be difficult to achieve with plastic as opposed to ebonite. So a lot of times with flex pens, like like actually all three of these brands have uh, flex nibs or well, Omos is not around anymore, but um, they had a flexible nib option on their pen. Noodlers is all about some flex nibs. And then uh, Omos has, um, they previously had the 88 last year in the flex and then they have uh, Optima in the flex right now. Uh, and they're going to have a number of those this year. So um, clearly the Ebonite feed is assisting in that, partly because you can shape them differently and partly because they are um, hydroscopic, which I talked about earlier in this broadcast, but the um, hydros hygroscopic um, actually assists in the capillary action in the feed. So it actually helps with ink flow just by being Ebonite. Uh, it's going to assist with that over plastic. So um, what was your question? How do you tell the difference between the two? It's hard. Basically, you can't. I mean, <laughs> you might be able to, um, but I'm going to show you, like, for example, I have uh, Noodlers. I'll just show you them all. I have Noodlers, I have Omos. I'll show you all the feeds, and you can check them out. Aurora is the easiest one to tell because it's, it just looks very different. It's red. Um, but I don't know. I guess if you didn't know that it was Ebonite, how would you know? <laughs> what kind of statement is that? If you didn't know, how would you know? You wouldn't because you don't know. Um, so I'm going to show you all of these. And uh, you try to tell me just by looking at them which is which, right? 
can you even? I mean, you might be able to tell based on the shape which pen it actually is, but. Um, so looking at all three of these, I'm gonna try to zoom in really, really good. So um, starting from uh, this side over here, which this is your left? My left, this is my left, you're looking at me, your right. I can't tell which way is which in the video. Um, so this is the Omos right here. Uh, try and get you a little light there. Omos, this is the Noodlers one right here. This one is Edison, and this one is Aurora. The Edison one is plastic. The others are all ebonite. Can you tell the difference just by looking at them? It's very difficult. Usually the plastic one might be a little bit smoother, a little shinier. If you feel it and you have like a pretty refined touch, you might be able to tell, but honestly, it's it's really difficult to, you, it's, it's hard. They weigh very similarly. They, you know, the fins, depending on how they're cut, like, okay, this Noodler's one seems a little more obvious. The Omos one, you know, you can see the machining marks in it a little bit, so you can tell it's a little more mechanical work there. It's kind of a giveaway. But honestly, like, the, the Aurora one, like, if you didn't know that it was Ebonite, how would you, how would you be able to tell? I don't know. I wish I had a magical answer for you. Um, the truth is, it's really hard to tell apart just by looking at them if you don't know anything else. And the easiest way is just to try to find out what pen model you're dealing with and, uh, and ask. You know, there's people that know pretty much everything about every pen. I try to be an expert, I don't know everything. Um, my team will try to find answers when we don't know. We put the information on our product pages and, and Ebonite Feeds is one of those things that we always try to call out if it has one because it is kind of special. The more difficult part is when you're dealing with vintage pens. You didn't specifically ask me about that, but it is definitely, um, you know, something that can be more difficult to troubleshoot when you're dealing with vintage pens because ebonite used to be much more the standard. You know, plastic wasn't as refined and as commonplace um, when fountain pens first came out. So ebonite was much more popular and ebonite feeds might've been more, much more the norm uh, than they are today. So modern pens, it's pretty much like, okay, you can assume it's plastic unless stated otherwise. When you do with vintage stuff, not only are you not necessarily, like you're not buying it maybe at a place that has a full product description of every detail of the pen. You might be at a pen show or an antique shop or something like that, and you might not know. It's really hard to tell. You pretty much need to know what model you're dealing with and see if it has one or not. That's pretty much the best I can tell you is try and find out. You can look on the Fountain Pen Network, lots of helpful folks there, especially you know the vintage stuff and uh, Goulet Nation Facebook group can be another great place. Lots of enthusiastic people there posting pictures of pens, asking questions about them and stuff, or other blogs and forums and stuff like that um, that might be able to help you out. Fountain Pen Geeks Forum, you know, other places, various, you know, influencers, uh, call them that, you know, people that have large followings on Instagram and stuff like that. You could DM them maybe and see if they have an idea he has lots of different ways to try to find out if you have a particular pen. I know I get DMs like that from time to time. Half the time I'm like, I have no clue what random vintage pen that is. I just don't know, so I can't help you. But sometimes I get lucky. All right, next question I have is from Mr. Hyde. No, sorry, M. Hyde on Twitter. Maybe Mr., but I don't know. M. Hyde on Twitter. I'm new to fountain pens and got a bunch of ink samples and a glass dip pen to test them with. The inks look gorgeous, heavily saturated but when I put the inks into my pen, they came out looking completely different, way more watery. I made sure there was no water in the pen and wrote with uh, the pen a bunch, nothing changed. I'm so disappointed. What's going on? Is there something I'm missing or a trick to get the ink to look like it does in a glass dip pen? I'm half a mind to journal using the dip pen, but that's not always convenient. Is it ever convenient? No, I wouldn't say that's convenient at all, but um, yeah, I feel your pain. Um, I had a glass dip pen, uh, and I'm gonna go grab it right now. So give me a hot second. I really missed a couple things here. I got a glass dip pen. This is a Jerobon large glass dip pen. And uh, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, write with it a little bit. So I grabbed a couple of inks. Um, and I actually have, uh, I tried to be fair and grab a pen that I already have inked up. So I have a Conklin Classic Firelines here with a broad nib inked up with Dimine Red Dragon. One of my all time favorite ink colors here. One of my favorite reds for sure. Um, so I'm going to use a glass pen, and if you've never seen a glass pen, you know, it functions pretty simply. It's a dip pen, so you just dip it right in there. And it's got these flutes in the, in the end of the nib. You can see how it's kind of, uh, you know, looks almost like serrated. Not serrated, but uh, it looks fluted because it has flutes. Um, and the, the ink kind of sits up in those flutes. And then when I write with it, uh, so I'm just going to write a glass pen. Ooh, this is a very wet... Um, very, very wet glass pen, right? 
Um, put that down right there. And uh, voila. So this is my writing with Diamond Red Dragon with a glass pen. Pretty thick, pretty wet. Looks, you know, pretty punchy, pretty vibrant, right? And I'm gonna do the same thing while you stare at my face. Hi. And I'm gonna write with a broad nib. And this is a fairly wet, this has got a Goulet nib on it, so it's a Yovo broad nib with the same ink. And you can see the difference between the two there. So the glass pen is going to write wetter. Now, all glass pens are not created equal. Glass pens are made by hand, as far as I know, all of them that we carry here are. And um, I don't know if that's the case with all glass pens ever, but that's the case with both the Jerobon and the Roger and Klingner ones. Um, and uh, they may vary depending on their thickness, depending on how they're manufactured. So um, the broad nib here, still pretty, still pretty broad, still pretty vibrant, but the glass pen is broader and more vibrant. So basically it sounds like what you're looking for is the broadest, wettest, whoops, wrong zoom, broadest, wettest possible combination that you can get. And you, my friend, are gonna be on a journey to try to find that for a little bit. So I think try and go with a broad or double broad or maybe even a stub if you're into getting any type of line variation. Um, that might be something that can help, but really you're gonna wanna get the absolute wettest writing pen that you can possibly find because these, these glass pens, I mean, think about it, there's nothing impeding the ink flow here. It's just ink that by its own capillary action is just gonna, there's nothing stopping it from just pouring onto the page and it's just gonna dump on there and it looks pretty cool. You got a paper that can handle it, uh, but assuming you do, um, you know, there's nothing holding you back. But fountain pens, there's a little more restriction there. There's a little more kind of holding it back. Even if you have a fairly wet writing pen, um, that's something that you might uh, find yourself struggling with a little bit. Now, sometimes you can, you can open that up, you can widen it up a little bit, but you're only gonna get so much ink flowing through that pen uh, as opposed to a dip pen where it's just kind of right there, uh, ready to go. But the dip pen, I mean, I wrote what, the equivalent of three or four words and my glass pen was out. So it's a huge convenience thing. Um, one little hack that you can do, um, of course you can always dip your fountain pen if you're so inclined, but one little hack, and this will depend on practicality. Um, this particular pen is a um, you know, cartridge converter pen, so you gotta unscrew it a little bit. And this has got a rubber O-ring on it too, so it's kind of a pain to unscrew constantly. But if you wanna do a little bit of a hack with a cartridge converter pen or a piston pen, um, pretty easy is you can just flood the feed, right? So I can actually take and just, um, I'm gonna load up and it's basically, I'm gonna let the ink down to the point where it's just like filling the feed, right? And it's gonna be really kind of, uh, all that ink is gonna be right there. And then I'm gonna go ahead and write um, with it filled. Nib uh, flooded. Maybe put a little bit of pressure down. Okay. And now I'll show you the difference there. Once my white balance uh, kind of corrects there. So I don't know how much you can tell there, but if I flood the feed, you can tell the difference between the flooded feed and kind of the regular one. So you're gonna have to open this up and do this every so often, but it's gonna last longer than just dipping the glass pen. So it can be a little bit of a hack if you want, and this can work on any, it doesn't just have to be a broad nib, just really any pen that you wanna get a deeper saturation if you want to kind of just sign your name, if you have a, a a shimmering ink or something like that, or a sheening ink, and you wanna get super wet thing just for your signature, you can flood your feed on most pens. It's harder with like a vacuum filling pen, crescent filling, certain other types of filling mechanisms, it's harder because you don't have as much control. But with any type of piston or twist mechanism, you can, you can flood your feed and get a darker, deeper saturated look, more shimmer, more sheen, um, for a, a period of time by flooding your feed. A little, little pen hack there for you if you are so interested. Um, but if you like that particular style, you can try to get a broadest nib possible, double broad, triple broad, or really hard to come by, but it's possible uh, on certain pens. Or uh, you can try flooding your feed as kind of a more regular practice. You have to manage that and kind of regulate it and open up your pen every, you know, so many words and then flood it again. But that would be 
perhaps more convenient than a glass pen. But either way, you can kind of achieve what you're looking to achieve with just a little bit of determination. Get a little bit of a headache here, just giving you a heads up. Oh, I think I'm dehydrated for today. I'm talking a lot, not drinking enough. All right, one last question to kind of finish this out. This is a personal question from Paul X on YouTube. We all know you started turning pens and power washing houses with your father. I don't know that everybody knows that, but now you do. Uh, but you've never said what started you on the path of pen turning. Why pens, basically? Um, I've talked about this a little bit, but you know, we gained a good number of subscribers recently and maybe not everybody knows the full story and I'm not gonna tell the full story because I can never tell the full story in less than 20 minutes. So go ahead and start the clock now, see if I can finish it in less than 20 minutes. Have I been going for 57 minutes already? Wow, I really do talk a lot, don't I? Anyway, why pens? Great question. Okay, um, you know, sometimes you just stumble into things and you don't really plan. That was definitely the case for me. What happened is Rachel and I had just gotten married. I was watching the new Yankee workshop. We didn't have cable television. I had like four channels that were these rabbit ears and it was terrible reception. Rachel, would, Rachel and I would sit there on a Saturday afternoon try to flip through and watch the channels and we would watch and be like what are we watching here it's all green is that golf and we couldn't even see the ball on the screen it was so grainy you know it's like we were watching golf and we couldn't see the ball talk about boring right like so we just didn't do a lot of that but i would like live for the whole week so that i could watch the new yankee workshop on pbs with norm abram and uh, I just loved it. I loved woodworking. I've always loved tools. And uh, Norm is like my guy. I mean, no doubt I'm influenced and passionate about doing educational style videos because I was so impacted by Norm Abram specifically and then David Marks had a show called Woodworks on the DIY channel. Those two specifically because of my passion for woodworking and tools and what I learned from them in video form, it was just like it for me. And it just like it clicked and I was like, this is it. So when we started thinking about like pens and pen videos and stuff, that's kind of where I drew that from. Anyway, why pens? Um, so I was into the woodworking thing. I was so dying to work with something with my hands, do woodworking. Norm was doing all this antique furniture, like, you know, replicas and stuff like that. And I was like, that looks amazing. And I don't have any of those tools. And I live in an apartment with a balcony, <laughs> you know? How am I going to do this? I'm on a garage, I'm a workshop, I don't have any way to do this, this stuff practically. Um, so I came up with an impractical way to do it. I had um, a catalog from Grizzly Industrial, uh, which I was trying to find one of these catalogs at home. I don't think I kept it 10 years later, um, but this was in 2007. Uh, so I had this Grizzly catalog. I'm not joking, this catalog is probably 400 pages thick. It's enormous, and it's got all these woodworking tools you know, planers and joiners and, you know, compound miter saws and table saws and dust collection systems. And I wanted it all. But of course, none of that was practical from a monetary a standpoint, a space standpoint, a practicality. It was just completely just, it was all pie in the sky. But I would just like look over this catalog, just pining for all this stuff. Um, but there were two pages out of this like 400 page catalog, two pages, one, one spread. Uh, that had pen turning materials. And I looked at it and I was like, oh, this lathe is fairly small. It's only a couple hundred dollars. You get these pen kits. And I was like intrigued. I was like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And I kind of thought through the process. I was like, you know, an antique furniture replica requires, a, you know, 10 years of skills and all these different tools to make. Not practical. Uh, but pen turning, you know, you have a little lathe. And I thought through it. And I like you drill a hole. You turn it on a lathe. You press it into a pen. I think I, could, I think I could do that as an entire project. So in my mind, I was like, I could do that. I, sh I should do that. Rachel, we, oh, hey, a couple hundred dollars, save up some money. Hey, Rachel, can we do this? Somehow, she went along with it, right? Like my wife is the most supportive and just, every, you know, she's amazing. So she went along with it. Somehow I convinced her it was an idea that made sense. Um, we had a, a covered balcony in our apartment, so I draped extension cords out the window. I built some, you know, tables out of, I think we had an old entertainment center that, um, you know, that uh, we had an old, like, CRT television that was, I'm not joking, was made the month after I was born. And Rachel and I were married at 22, 
uh, in 23. I was 23 at the time that we started pursuing this. Uh, and uh, we had this entertainment center, this huge wooden thing, and we ended up having to get a new television. Um, which was another CRT television, <laughs> which we got for free. Uh, but it wouldn't fit in this cabinet anymore. So we had this giant heavy cabinet that nobody wanted because everybody was moving to flat screens. It, it fit a standard size TV, so you couldn't fit a widescreen. It was just, it was a useless piece of furniture. So I actually chopped it up and used the sides of the entertainment center to make my first uh, workbenches to turn my pens on, right? Like I was just being super resourceful. And, um, and so I bought these like grizzly tools and I, you know, built my own little workshop. Strung, I mean, I had lights out there, I had everything, um, pegboard, you name it. I had a whole workshop out on this covered balcony of our apartment. And uh, I started turning pens and, you know, I, I started turning pens and the thing that I liked about pens is like, oh, you don't have to be passionate about woodworking to appreciate a pen. Yeah, if you, if you make furniture, okay, you're not buying furniture every day. There's only certain people that need furniture and appreciate fine wooden furniture, but everybody can use a pen. So I was thinking, well, I can make a pen and you know, what the heck, I could sell it to anybody that wants a pen and uh, maybe they'll get turned on to woodworking and my fine craftsmanship through the fact that, you know, hey, they could use a pen. Hey, this is cool. Oh, maybe a wood pen. I never thought about that. Um, so that was originally kind of what got me going. And I was like, well, the more pens I sell, the more woodworking I can do and the more tools I can buy and the more wood I can buy. That's the way that like uh, a, an any type of business that's started by a passion or a hobby uh, often starts as like, you know, ooh, if, if I sell more, then I can buy more tools. <laughs> that, was that, was, that was the original vision of the Goulet Pen Company was like, how can I loosely justify my tools? And, and by the way, maybe making a living would be great. Um, but my 22, 23 year old mind wasn't quite there yet. Once we, uh, you know, got pregnant with our, our first child, that's when things really kicked into gear for me. I was like, oh, I need to provide for my family. Okay, game's changed. That's when I started to pursue, you know, more, um, you know, uh, ambitious ways to sell pens. And I discovered I really needed a community around them who were really passionate about pens, hence fountain pens, and then the rest is history. I did okay. I explained that in maybe six or seven minutes. But anyway, I basically priced myself out as I was making pens from the casual, anybody could use a pen to a point where I was making like $200 finely crafted pens, which is pretty cheap for how much work I was putting into them. But, um, you know, I priced myself out and I was like only into like the most kind of collector grade people that were into pens. And there's just not that many people out there that are into collector grade rollerball wooden pens, you know, and not to mention I wasn't the only one doing it. So, um, that's when I made the pivot into fountain pens and the rest is history. So there we go. My question of the week for you for this week is about ink waterproofness. Because that came up a couple of times in the questions here this week. Uh, does it matter? Ink waterproofness, does it matter to you? Maybe a lot, maybe a little, maybe sometimes. I would love to hear how much it matters. Get some good conversation going in the comments. I would love to hear that. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already. We're so close to 100,000. I want to get to 100,000. That'd be really cool. So share it with your friends if you haven't already. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I would appreciate it very much. Um, I think that's about it. Be sure to check out all these goodies on goodlaypens.com. If they're there, I think half the pens that I mentioned here we don't carry, but uh, maybe even more. Jeez, I really brought out a lot that we don't have this week, but I just like to torture you like that. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great rest of your week and right on. Thank you.